Ancient Egypt, a great civilization whose origins remain shrouded in mystery. The Rock here on location in Egypt. Man, it's hot here. To uncover the real story of the Scorpion King. Okay, so I'm not here in Egypt. I'm here on the back lot for my new film, The Scorpion King, who was one of Egypt's first rulers. This guy was powerful, charismatic, and so strikingly handsome. Wow, kind of just like me. But did you know there was an actual Scorpion King who walked the earth more than 5,000 years ago? and archaeologists are just beginning to learn more about him now. But from what we already know so far, this guy was a pretty bad dude in his own right. King Scorpion was his name, conquered rival leaders. He had the biggest tomb on the block, and he may have even helped invent the written language. We're talking about a man who just might have laid the groundwork for one of the greatest civilizations in human history. He's also the inspiration for one of the greatest films in human history, at least in my highly unbiased opinion. So stick around and learn more as the History Channel brings you the story of the real Scorpion King. Egypt, birthplace of civilization. Land of pyramids, mummies, hieroglyphs, animal-headed gods, and mighty kings. Scholars thought they knew how it all began, but they are wrong. Today, archaeologists from around the world are trekking into Egypt's most desolate deserts, sifting the sands for clues and wrangling the world's deadliest creatures in a quest to uncover the origins of this mystifying land and the identity of its first pharaohs. What they are finding is a whole new dynasty and a mysterious unknown king. His name inspired a Hollywood film, The Scorpion King. But the facts about his life are more fascinating than the fiction. King Scorpion may be responsible for writing, religion, ritual warfare, and monumental building, invented at a time we didn't even know existed. The search for the real Scorpion King is a 5,000 year journey to the birth of Egyptian civilization. Egypt is a land so old that it was ancient even at the time of ancient Greece and the Roman Empire. By the year zero and the birth of Jesus, Egyptian civilization was already in the past. Ancient Egypt ebbed from existence with the death of its last great pharaoh, the legendary Cleopatra. Cleopatra was only 39 when she died, but Egypt was over 3,000 years old. Much is known about the end of Egyptian civilization, but little is known about its birth. How did it all begin? To trace the origins of ancient Egypt, one must travel back to 3500 BC. It is before recorded time. Nomadic tribes roam the fertile floodplains along the Nile River. Over tens of thousands of years, their temporary encampments grow into villages and towns. The settlements form allegiances and rivalries. In the south is the sophisticated Upper Kingdom, deriving its name from its upstream position on the Nile River. Its ruler wears the tall, bulbous, white crown of Upper Egypt. In the north, where the delta fans into the Mediterranean Sea, rises its loosely organized counterpart, the Lower Kingdom, controlled by the wearer of the tongued Red Crown. Egypt as we know it, land of pyramids, sphinxes, mummies, and pharaohs, is born when the first king unites the upper and lower kingdoms. But who is the first king of Egypt? Ironically, that question even plagued the ancient Egyptians.
To keep track of their rulers, the ancient Egyptians actually created a list called the King's List. They are elaborately carved murals on temple walls. As each new king would take the throne, he would add his name to the list, writing his name within a circle called a cartouche. At the top of each name is the Egyptian symbol for kingship, Horus, a falcon they revered as a god and who they believed to be the father of the first human king of Egypt. These kings lists provide an essential clue in the search for Egypt's first king. King lists were important to the Egyptians because they didn't have calendars in the way we do. They reckoned time by the year in a king's reign. But in addition, king lists were important because the king needed to legitimize his reign. And if he could look back on his ancestors and trace his ancestry all the way back to the very first Horus king, that made him a powerful ruler. After the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great, he uses the king's list to help him establish a new dynasty of Greek pharaohs. The Ptolemaic kings, of which Cleopatra is the last important ruler, legitimize their reign as Greeks by carving their names onto the king's list, placing themselves in the lineage of Egypt's great pharaohs. But the Ptolemies also used the king's list as a calendar, a window into Egypt's past. For the first time, they chronicle the history of Egypt in a language other than hieroglyphics. In fact, it's the Greeks who name Egyptian writing hieroglyphics, which means sacred carvings. The most important book about Egypt written in Greek is the three-volume Egyptiaca. In the second century BC, a priest named Manetho was commissioned by one of the Ptolemaic kings to write a history of Egypt. And in this, he traced out 30 dynasties all the way back to the very first one, which was founded by a king he called Menes, who was the first king of the first dynasty. But just how reliable is the king's list? At the time that Manetho was writing, the king's list was already trying to trace history back 3,000 years. To make matters worse, we only know about Manetho's translation of the king's list from other ancient scholars. The original Egyptiaca was lost. Then, with the rise of Christianity in the 4th century AD, Egyptian sacred writing was banned as devil worship, and soon it was completely forgotten. For more than a thousand years, the history of ancient Egypt and its first king will remain a mystery. Then, in 1799, while Napoleon's troops are looting the treasures of Egypt, a French soldier uncovers a large stone plaque it's the Rosetta Stone. On the stone was writing in three languages. Greek, Demotic, and Ancient Egyptian. The soldier immediately knew that he had discovered an important clue to deciphering Egypt's mysterious past. Napoleon ordered prints to be made and dispersed to scholars around the world. The race was on to crack the code. Twenty-three years later, using one of Napoleon's prints, Jean-Francois Champollion, a French linguist who could read Greek and Demotic, deciphers the hieroglyphics. Amazingly, he cracks the code without setting foot in Egypt. But not only does Napoleon's printing off the stone lead to the decipherment of the long-forgotten writing system, it also results in a surprising new discovery. For years we thought the Rosetta Stone was made out of black basalt. But in the past two years it's actually changed color and turned gray and pink. And that's because as soon as it was discovered, they coated it with ink so they could make the rubbings, so they could disperse the copies of the inscriptions. 
In the last two years, conservation began on the stone, and they realized that, hmm, this black washes off to reveal that it's actually a gray granite piece of stone, not black basalt, as we've thought for almost 200 years now. Black or gray, the Rosetta Stone leads to one of the greatest discoveries of all time. The newfound ability to read hieroglyphics opens a whole new world to the past. Suddenly, 19th century scholars and treasure seekers alike can read the original Egyptian sources. They rediscover King Menes as the first pharaoh of the first dynasty. But soon, there is new doubt. In 1898, two young Egyptologists unearth a ceremonial cosmetics tray that literally repaints the face of Egyptian history. It is one of the most important documents of ancient Egypt. It's called the Narmer Palette, named after the central figure on the palette, King Narmer. But there's a problem. Narmer is not on the king's list. Yet the symbolism on the palette suggests that Narmer may be responsible for unifying Upper and Lower Egypt. This would make him the first king of the first dynasty. On one side, the bearded King Narmer wears the feathered crown of Lower Egypt as he inspects a row of decapitated prisoners. On the other side, he wears the rounded crown of Upper Egypt and wields a mace over a kneeling captive. So, is it Narmer, a king who's not even on the king's list, that conquers both Upper and Lower Egypt? This concept of a true unifier at the beginning of the first dynasty seems best suited to Narmer, at least on the basis of his palette and what we know from other material, that he at least eliminates any final opposition to a completely unified pharaonic rule throughout the country. The symbolism on the Narmer palette was enough to convince early Egyptologists that King Narmer not Menes, is the founder of Pharaonic Egypt. Narmer's palette opens a floodgate of questions. Is the king's list wrong? Had the Egyptians who carved the royal list forgotten their own origins? Are there more kings before the time of Narmer? Ironically, the object that may hold the answers was discovered at the same time as Narmer's palette, scarcely 30 feet away. On it, an unidentified man faces the image of a scorpion. Only now, 100 years after its discovery, are Egyptologists beginning to identify this mysterious figure. Who can he be? The mysterious object with the image of a man and scorpion is a large ritual mace head. The mace, or battle club, is one of the earliest symbols of kingly power in ancient Egypt. Throughout 3,000 years of Egyptian history, kings are depicted smashing the skulls of their enemies with maces. Mace heads that were used in combat are about the size of baseballs. But ritual mace heads can be the size of basketballs and weigh over 20 pounds. The one with the man and scorpion image is the earliest ceremonial mace head ever found. Could it be the mace of another unknown king? Only now, over a century after its discovery, are Egyptologists beginning to understand its significance. The central figure on the mace head wears the white crown of Upper Egypt and he's involved in some sort of a ritual act, probably opening up a canal. This is the earliest image of a king wearing the white crown of Egypt. Another first is the image of the king bringing water to the land. It will become symbolic of bringing wealth to the people throughout Pharaonic Egypt. 
Hanging from the king's skirt is yet another pharaonic symbol, the bull's tail. The bull's tail was probably symbolic of the pharaoh taking on the attributes of a bull, being strong and virile and powerful. And um, this is the earliest evidence of the pharaoh being shown as this in this way. And this is obviously traits that he was supposed to continue on with throughout the pharaonic period. Along the top of the mace head are lapwing birds hanging from poles. These poles represent different regions of Upper Egypt. The lapwing birds are the symbol for conquered people. Who is this divine figure that conquers Upper Egypt? Based on the iconography, the figure's size, the activities he's engaged in, the people around him, but more than anything else, his crown, there is no doubt that this is a king of Upper Egypt. That the key to his identity are the figures in front of him, the rosette and the scorpion, which are to be read King Scorpion. Who is this King Scorpion? Why, after 5,000 years, are we hearing about him only now? At first, some Egyptologists refuse to believe he is real. They interpret the symbolism as evidence of a mythical god. After all, there is a tradition in Egyptian religion that combines characteristics of animals and humans. The gods of ancient Egypt are frequently shown as being either animals or part human and part animal. And um, this is perhaps because the Egyptian pantheon, all of their gods, were really drawn from the natural world. So anything they saw in nature that they needed either protection against or um, that they used to help them with or to explain um, became a divinity after some time, which is why there were so many animal divinities. Depicted as half man, half jackal, the god Anubis ruled from the underworld, presiding over the art of mummification. The female hippopotamus assumes human legs to become Tawaret, the goddess of maternity and childbirth, protector of women and children. Sobek, the crocodile god, was the protector of the pharaoh. As sacred animals, crocodiles were bred and revered in temples and often mummified after death. But gods weren't the only figures to take on attributes from the animal world. Kings also aligned themselves with important animals. One of the most enduring symbols of ancient Egypt, the Sphinx, is a portrait of the pharaoh as a powerful lion. Animals were often associated with people in the ancient world because um, they had them as sort of totemic animals. They were a bit like mascots. They were the symbol of either your clan or the individual themselves. What are the characteristics of a scorpion? And why would a god or king of Egypt identify with the powers of this creature? To find out, one of the world's leading experts on lethal insects, Major Scott Stockwell, and entomologists in the U.S. Army will wrangle some of the Earth's most deadly creatures. There are over 1,500 species of scorpion with names like Southern Man Killer, the Emperor Scorpion, and the Death Stalker. Scorpions were one of the first animals to colonize land. They date back in the fossil record to over 420 million years ago. That's 200 million years before the first dinosaur. Since that time, they've changed relatively little. Scorpions we see today look just about the same as they did 420 million years ago. These animals are the ultimate survivors. Scorpions can endure extreme fluctuations in temperature, ranging from a high of 115 degrees Fahrenheit to a low of 17. Amazingly, they can even be frozen in a block of ice and be revived. Scorpions can sustain themselves for three months without food or water. A chemical in their skin helps them retain moisture in the intense desert sun, but the chemical also has an unusual side effect. Under ultraviolet light, the scorpion will fluoresce.
The main method of the scorpion's defense is a sting that delivers a potent soup of poisons to any would-be attacker. Of the 1,500 known species of scorpion, 20 can kill humans, and several of those are found only in Egypt. This is a common Egyptian scorpion. Its scientific name is Androctonus australis. Translated in Latin, that means southern man-killer. He's very aptly named, as it, it carries a very, very potent neurotoxic venom. And it carries a lot of it. This would have been a common thing for the Egyptians to run into on a daily basis. He's very fast. He's a silent killer. And it's easy to understand why King Scorpion would have modeled himself after this animal. In ancient times, people often died from the sting of a scorpion. But if they did survive, for a few hours after being stung, they would have felt like they were about to die. The immediate pain is something like hitting yourself in the finger with a hammer, or perhaps having a red-hot ice pick jabbed into your flesh. Very, very unpleasant. Very, very painful. Because scorpions release a neurotoxic venom into the nervous system, a victim can feel pain throughout the body. Immediately you might notice pain in your joints, especially on the elbow or in your armpit if you've been stung on the hand, or in the groin if you've been stung on, say, the foot. You may get some tingling in your chest. You may also experience nausea or excess salivation. You may drool, which is very unpleasant for anybody. These are all symptoms of an excessive release of adrenaline and blood pressure hormones, which cause the heart to beat arrhythmically and the circulatory system to collapse. This may cause your lungs to fill up with fluid. Either of these, the problems with your heart or filling up with, uh, with fluid in your lungs, can actually cause death. And this is how most people die. Fortunately, today, we can get to a hospital and get specific treatment for scorpion stings, so we don't see deaths like we used to. But certainly, in ancient times, being stung by one of these scorpions would certainly have been a death sentence. Its deadly sting, the speed of its attack, and its ability to survive in extreme conditions are the natural characteristics of a scorpion. Based on the ancient Egyptian tradition that combines animals and humans, this king scorpion could easily be a mythological god or a real king. Which is he? An Egyptian deity or a living, breathing man? One way to prove that he is real is to find his tomb. But where in the vast deserts of Egypt do you begin to search for a 5,000-year-old burial that may not even exist? Modern Abydos. Located 300 miles south of Cairo, most visitors would never expect that this remote village was once the most important city in ancient Egypt. Yet on the outskirts of town, several international expeditions are working to unearth evidence of Egypt's first rulers. Among them is the team from the German Archaeological Institute, led by Gunter Dreyer. Millions of shirts. These shirts are the remains of offering vessels of pilgrims who came here to worship Osiris, the god of the dead. And these shirts gave the name to Abydos, the modern name Umilgab, mother of pots. Bound on one side by the lazy waters of the Nile River, and on the other by imposing desert cliffs, Abydos, the Egyptian necropolis, a city of the dead, appears to be little more than a sand-swept ruin in the unforgiving Sahara. But this area was once a fertile floodplain, and today Egyptologists are uncovering a record of human occupation that dates back further than 4000 BC. Abydos was ancient even to the early Egyptians. As far back as 2000 BC, distant ancestors of these workers were conducting some of the first archaeological digs in history. 
Just as today, the ancient Egyptians sifted the sands, searching for evidence of Egypt's founding kings and the remains of ancestral gods. Abydos was once the most holy place in all Egypt. Because the Egyptians supposed that the god of the dead, Osiris, was buried here also. According to mythology, he was a former king of Egypt. And so it was quite natural to suppose he must have been buried here. And they carried out large-scale excavations to find his tomb. They thought they had found it and installed a cult place here. And every pious Egyptian tried to come here to make his offering for Osiris. And there you see the remains of all these offerings. Millions of pot shirts. Over 4,000 years of broken pots. Pots as far as the eye can see. Each sherd represents an offering of fine wine or imported oil brought here by ordinary Egyptians seeking a secure afterlife. The broken vessels rest upon remains of an elaborate temple city long since reclaimed by the shifting desert sands. Yet one major monument still rises above the desolate landscape, a temple dedicated to Osiris, the god of the underworld and father of Egypt's first mythological king, Horus the Falcon. The Osiris Temple consists of over a dozen sanctuaries and shrines. The murals, some of the finest in all of Egypt, celebrate the earthly king's connection to Egypt's mythological founders. The further one goes into the temple, the more sacred the story. Deep within the temple is a mural depicting one of the holiest legends of Egyptian religion, a story that holds an important clue to uncovering Egypt's first kings. Here, in the inner sanctuary of the temple, is the myth of Osiris and Isis, and their son, Horus. Way back in the Golden Age, when gods ruled Egypt, the god Osiris, who was married to his sister Isis, used to rule Egypt. Osiris was a good and just king, and everyone loved him, except for his brother Set. Set became increasingly jealous of Osiris and his popularity and wanted to rule Egypt. So um, he contrived a plan to take Osiris' place. He had a beautiful chest ordered, which was decorated with semi-precious stones, but it was made precisely to the size of Osiris. Then Set decided to hold a great banquet and invited all and sundry to this. During the course of the banquet, towards the end, when everyone was very merry, um, Set said, everyone should try out this box um, to see who fits it. Whoever fits it can have it. So it's very much like the Cinderella idea. Well, many people tried and no one fit in. So in the end, Osiris finally stepped into it and of course he was a perfect fit. So Set and his cohorts slammed down the lid of the box and they flung Osiris's um, body off into the Nile. Isis, of course, was beside herself with grief and she decided to do something about this. So she went throughout Egypt and collected the pieces of Osiris. And she was very successful in all of this, except she was missing one vital organ, um, which, being great of magic, she managed to make out of mud. And um, by using her magic, she reanimated Osiris so that he briefly lived again. Then she turned herself into a kite, a bird, and she mated with Osiris and gave birth to the god Horus, who later on became Pharaoh of Egypt. It is Horus and his father Osiris, the mythological founders of Egypt, who give Abydos its sacred significance. Amazingly, the search for treasure and mythological gods eventually leads archaeologists to the discovery of Egypt's first real kings. One of the first excavations in Abydos was in 1895, 
They dug close to 160 tombs in four days, claimed to have found the actual tomb of Osiris, displayed a skull they declared to be the head of the god, and left. Then an Englishman, Sir Flinders Petrie, arrived on the scene. Although he rejected the idea that Osiris was buried here, he did suspect that Abydos might contain the tombs of Egypt's first kings. But how to prove it? Petrie thought the wealth of potsherds might hold a clue. Flinders Petrie used the types of pottery uh, that were in use in prehistoric Egypt as a tool to create a relative chronology for this period which is without written records. By observing how these different kinds of pottery occurred in the grave groups he was excavating, he was able to establish a sequence of developments in pottery which he then divided into 49 numbered stages. Petrie was the first Egyptologist to associate material evidence, the pottery grave goods and the tombs themselves, to the Egyptian king's list. By matching his pottery chronology to the ancient Egyptians' king's list, Petrie confirmed that these are the burial places of the kings of Dynasty I. He filled in the later stages of his timeline first, stages 31 to 49. He suspected that somewhere out there in Abydos might be the tombs of even earlier kings, the kings before the king's list. Petrie was a wise man. He realized that there would probably be future research on the even earlier stages of Egyptian prehistory, and so he left stages numbers 1 to 30 blank for future research, which would tell us about the even earlier prehistory of Egypt. Here, in an area of Abydos previously overlooked, Gunter Dreyer is literally picking up the pieces where Petrie left off. He is searching for those earlier tombs, the tombs of kings before Dynasty One, the tombs of Dynasty Zero. This is the oldest part of the royal necropolis of Abydos. Very little was known from the earlier excavations. We observed there are many sherds lying around in this area, like this. And so we decided to reinvestigate it. As they survey the pottery strewn landscape, they discover depressions in the ground, which often indicates the existence of underground tombs. Based on the number of tombs and their sizes, the team anticipates a significant find. But where to start digging? At the very beginning, we chose a pit here and came upon a very large tomb, which was not mentioned in the old reports. They begin to dig, and soon, just below desert level, the team strikes upon the first mud brick wall. As sand is removed, they could see that the wall was part of a large underground chamber. Continuing on, they unearth more bricks, more walls, and more chambers, until there are 12 chambers in all. This is no ordinary tomb. It is the largest pre-dynastic tomb ever found. In fact, it is comparable in size to some of the tombs of the first dynasty kings. So, whose tomb is it? Unfortunately, probably in ancient times, the tomb had been pillaged of its most valuable grave goods. The mummy is missing. The few remaining artifacts are brought back to the German mission's headquarters in Abydos, where Dreyer and his team examine the evidence. The large chamber contained traces of a wooden shrine and was connected to all the other chambers by means of small slits kind of model doors. And we think that this 
group of nine chambers is representing a model palace. Some of the chambers were still filled up with pottery. One kind of pottery was especially interesting because it was non-Egyptian pottery but imported. Imported pottery from Palestine. Wine jars. Several hundred altogether. These jars from Palestine indicate that international trade routes already existed. Hundreds of imported vessels must mean the tomb belongs to someone of great wealth and power. We came upon quite a lot of ivory objects, like this, or that. Gaming pieces for a table game. Obviously they were a little bit afraid that afterlife is somewhat boring. And so they were well equipped with games. One of the ivory objects from a game played like dice is the same as a piece found in the tomb of King Tut buried 2,000 years later. Dreyer suspects that this is indeed the tomb of an unknown king of Egypt. Then he finds the ultimate symbol of kingly power. Within the large chamber we found in the corner an ivory scepter telling us this certainly was a royal tomb. The scepter, shaped like a shepherd's crook, will become a symbol of pharaonic power for the next 3,000 years. Using carbon-14 dating, Dreyer determines that this is the earliest intact scepter ever found in Egypt. With the ancient scepter in hand, Dreyer is positive that he has discovered a king before the time of kings. What is his name? We came upon lots of fragments of pottery, some complete ones, with ink inscriptions. And the most remarkable are those showing a scorpion. And from these inscriptions we were finally able to conclude that this tomb belonged to a ruler by the name of Scorpion. He is real. There is a King Scorpion. No mythological god has an earthly tomb. The discovery of King Scorpion's burial is positive proof that he ruled Upper Egypt as a real king more than 5,000 years ago. But he is a king before the Age of Kings, and his discovery launches a whole new dynasty, Dynasty Zero. Who is King Scorpion? What role does he play in creating ancient Egypt, one of the greatest civilizations the world has known? The burial practices reflected in King Scorpion's tomb plant the seed for the burial of all pharaohs for the rest of Egyptian history. Scorpion is the first person who really started off what became dynastic practice and his burial, which was over 5,000 years ago, he started to make his tomb so that it replicated his palace. So in a way he was creating a house for his soul that would be eternal. Although simple in structure, it's easy to see how, for the first time, Scorpion's tomb creates an architectural plan to reach the afterlife. It is modeled on the palace in which he lived, and upon his death, his body is placed inside. When complete, the tomb is covered by sand and in the shape of the primeval mound, from which, according to Egyptian religion, the world was created. Besides its spiritual significance, the tomb was also designed to supply King Scorpion with all the material goods he will need in the afterlife. King Scorpion, presumably a very important king from the size of his tomb, was buried with great pomp and circumstance and had a great many grave goods initially in his tomb. Of course, now very little remain because they have been robbed out in antiquity. Um, 
we assumed that most pharaohs had food, drink, um, lots of jars with oils and unguents in them, as well as a lot of gold and semi-precious stones. The only king that we have some idea about in terms of what they had in their burials comes from the tomb of Tutankhamun. His tomb was not robbed, so we do get an idea of the wealth, the enormous number of objects and gold and other things that was put into a pharaoh's tomb. Each generation of king will expand on Scorpion's basic concept and design, and over the centuries, royal burials will evolve into the pyramids. At Abydos, 500 years of kings are buried in line after King Scorpion and Gunter Dreyer's team is excavating each of them, one by one. This one has been fully excavated and partially restored. The staircase is leading down to the burial chamber. The staircase is now covered by sand. It's the most elaborate tomb of the first dynasty, the tomb of King Den. Although King Den's tomb was built 300 years after Scorpion's tomb, it shares the same basic structure, a large square pit dug into the ground and lined with mud brick walls. There was another door here blocking the entrance. And now we are entering the royal burial chamber. The chamber was once paved with large slabs of red and black granite. In the center of the tomb was a huge wooden shrine, almost filling the whole chamber. Around the shrine would have been offerings similar to those found in Scorpion's tomb. In principle, this burial chamber is like Scorpion's burial chamber, a large pit with brick lining. But here the brick lining has a thickness of four meters. The roof was built with large cedar beams, probably imported from Lebanon. Above the roof, just as in Scorpion's tomb, was a mound of sand representing the primeval mound. But this mound was encased in mud brick, creating a long, low, bench-like platform known as a mastaba, the Arabic word for bench. 500 years after Scorpion, the second dynasty pharaoh, Kasa Kimwe, will build the largest and the last tomb at Abydos. But Casa Kimwe adds an important innovation to Scorpion's mound. He builds his mastaba in stone. In fact, it's still, uh, in principle, the same a brick-lined pit. But here, for the first time, the royal burial chamber is all built in stone. Casa Kimwe adds more than just size and stone to Scorpion's architecture for the afterlife. He adds an entirely new component. A half mile from his tomb is another monumental funerary structure built by Casa Kimwe. When Egyptologists first discovered it, they weren't sure what it was. Some thought it was a fort. Others believed it might be the storehouse built by Joseph in the Bible. Further investigation proved it is a massive funerary enclosure intended to be Casa Kimwe's house of eternity. It is constructed entirely of mud bricks, made the same way as the mud bricks used in the tomb of King Scorpion. In fact, the exact same recipe is used today. Mix earth, straw and water, drop the mixture into forms, and bake in the sun. Casa Kimwe's workers made millions of mud bricks, and they hauled them from over a mile away to construct the walls of the enclosure, 36 feet high and 18 feet thick. Today, Casa Kimwe's funerary enclosure is the largest freestanding mud brick structure in the world. Casa Kimwe's monumental funerary enclosure certainly leaves a lasting impression on the man who literally adds the next step to King Scorpion's architecture for the afterlife, Imhotep, the architect of Egypt's first pyramid. 
Imhotep designs for his pharaoh a burial complex that combines Casa Kimwe's funerary enclosure with the mastaba. But Imhotep goes two steps further. Instead of mud brick walls, he uses stone. And instead of one mastaba, he stacks them. I need everyone to think about this stone and look at it. This is the first stone to be used in any building in history. That is a step pyramid. The step pyramid changes the face of Egypt forever. Aided by 5,000 years of erosion, archaeologists have discovered how the step pyramid evolves from Scorpion's simple tomb. Imhotep starts with the simple bench, or mastaba. He then finishes the mastaba in white limestone, perhaps because he originally never thought of building any higher. But then he decides to stack one stone mastaba atop another until it reaches six layers. When complete, the step pyramid is the biggest building in the world. At the heart of this colossal structure is the same belief that inspired the tomb of King Scorpion. Then all this evolution from the Mastapa in Apirus until the great pyramids of Giza, it is for the king to be buried for the afterlife. Within a hundred years, the step pyramid evolves into the true pyramid. For the next thousand years, pharaohs will build pyramids to ensure their passage to the afterlife. Pyramid construction reaches its apex at Giza, about 2500 BC. Measuring 500 feet tall and 800 feet wide, the Great Pyramid of Khufu is the largest stone structure in the world and owes its very existence to Scorpion's simple mud brick tomb. But King Scorpion's architecture for the afterlife isn't his only contribution to the greatness of Egypt. A discovery on the floor of his burial chamber may prove to be even more monumental than the mighty pyramids. What Gunter Dreyer and his team found on the floor of King Scorpion's tomb fits comfortably inside a shoebox. Although small in size, its significance is monumental. What they found are tiny postage stamp sized bone and ivory tags, 160 in all. Each of King Scorpion's tags is carved with simple pictures, trees, birds, snakes, and elephants. At first glance, the etchings look like primitive drawings, similar to those found in caves and on prehistoric pottery. With primitive paintings, a picture is what it is. An image of a bird means bird. But King Scorpion's tags may mean something more. The first clue Dreyer noticed is that many of them contain more than one image, an intriguing complexity for such primitive carvings. This, for example, shows an elephant on mountains and a tree. This one shows a tree and a dog-like animal, or jackal. First, Dreyer tried to interpret Scorpion's tags as groups of drawings, but found they didn't make sense. He wondered, what if these etchings are not just pictures, but rather 
symbols. If so, it would make King Scorpion's tags the world's earliest known writing. At the first glance, we didn't know what they were made for, but some of the signs inside there reminded us of hieroglyphs. And so, we study them rather carefully and try to find out whether is it writing or not. Dreyer began his investigation by using a radiocarbon process to date the tags. But the results were not what he expected. King Scorpion's tags date to around 3250 BC, more than 200 years earlier than what was known to be the birth of writing. Writing is believed to have originated around 3000 BC in Mesopotamia, in what is now modern-day Iraq. Known as cuneiform, this wedge-shaped script was created by pressing sticks or reeds into wet clay. Evidence suggests that the cuneiform alphabet evolved from a simpler numbering system. Scholars have long believed that through trade, Mesopotamians introduced their writing system to Egypt. Then, at the beginning of the first dynasty, about 3000 BC, the Egyptians adapted the Mesopotamian script into Egyptian hieroglyphics. But if Dreyer's suspicions about King Scorpion's tags are correct, it totally refutes the currently accepted theory about the origins of writing. It would mean that Egyptian writing originated independently of Mesopotamia. The discovery would mean that writing, perhaps the single most important invention in the world, was created first in Egypt. But how to prove it? To be considered a true writing system, each picture must mean more than what it represents. A snake must be more than a snake. It must represent a phonetic value. In other words, a snake must be a letter in the alphabet. Using Egyptian hieroglyphs as a guide, Dreyer tries to read Scorpion's tags phonetically. Well, this tag shows the elephant on mountains. If we put the phonetic value of similar hieroglyphs, the elephant would read Ab and the mountains Jew. Together it's Ab Jew. And that's the name of Abydos. So with this tag it works to read it as early hieroglyphic writing. Just as Dreyer had hoped, the elephant and mountains function as letters of the alphabet. Together, they form syllables to spell out the name of the ancient town of Abydos. But will the strategy work with other tags? Well, we continued and have here a label showing a snake above mountains. Well, from hieroglyphic writing that this phonetic value of the snake is J. Mountains, as mentioned just before, has a reading Ju. Beside, there's a sign reminding of the sign for night. Horizon or the lightning. Phonetic value would be Gerech. So we have here Ju Gerech, mountains, of darkness. Dreyer noticed that the sign for mountains, Jew, appears on several other tags. Well, we have other labels showing the same group of a snake above mountains, but beside there is not the sign for darkness, but a bird. And the phonetic value of this bird is Yah, and this means sunshine. And they would read mountains of sunlight. Mountains of darkness and mountains of sunlight. That's what they say phonetically. But what does it mean? 
he didn't have to look beyond the landscape of his excavation site to find out. In Upper Egypt that's quite clear. The sun rises in the east, above mountains. The sun sets in the west, above mountains or behind mountains. The tags refer to the eastern and western mountains, two distinct regions of Upper Egypt. Dreyer is confident that he is reading the world's first writing. And these labels can be understood only as phonetic writing. As symbols, these signs would make no sense at all. By reading King Scorpion's tags, Gunter Dreyer is literally rewriting history. The tags from Scorpion's tomb prove that Egyptian hieroglyphics was a more complete writing system earlier than Mesopotamian cuneiform. But there is another intriguing aspect about the birth of writing in Egypt. The lack of evidence of a more primitive writing system prior to the time of King Scorpion suggests that the writing system did not evolve since writing suddenly just appears at the time of King Scorpion, perhaps it was an invention that was ordered into being. The king at the time realized that he needed a writing system that could cover taxation and whatnot, and he ordered his courtiers to create one, and they did. And that's what they show. It's not a slow development. It was almost literally invented overnight. It may be premature to say that it was King Scorpion who ordered the invention of writing. But clearly, the tags in his tomb are proof that King Scorpion understood the need for writing and had the power to use it. Writing is a very important invention because it transports information. Writing is a means to keep information of events. This is a later development, but it is the step from prehistory to history. Did King Scorpion have history in mind, if it was indeed he who ordered the invention of writing? We may never know. But the reading of the tags and their archaeological context do provide a clue to how the tags were used Dreyer found the tags on the floor of the tomb, and because many of the tags have small holes, he believes they were attached to wooden boxes, bolts of linen, and jars of oil that were delivered as payment to King Scorpion from cities he ruled. Essentially, the tags are receipts for paid taxes. What is the main thing of ruling? It's collecting taxes. One has to control who has paid, who has sent what. With a small unit, it's rather easy. But when this unit becomes larger, it becomes complicated. They had to invent, to develop a system to get information stored. And this is writing. In the hands of King Scorpion, writing becomes a tool to amass wealth and power. But with that wealth and power comes rivalries. Now King Scorpion must use military might to protect his kingdom and lay the foundation for the unification of all Egypt. How did King Scorpion conquer Upper Egypt? The answer lies along the natural course of the Nile in an area where the river curves dramatically east to accommodate the encroaching western desert. Known as the Kenna Bend, this area was once a major center of activity in the ancient world. Egyptologist John Darnell of Yale University has been exploring the area for over a decade. Today he reveals a once-in-a-lifetime discovery one that may unlock the mysteries of King Scorpion's rise to power 
and could prove to be the earliest historic document in Egypt, and possibly the world. On one of the major ancient routes connecting the Kenna Band with the Western Desert, at a very strategic location, a desert pass in the middle of the Kenna Band, roughly between Abydos in the north and Hierakonpolis in the south, we made a rather remarkable discovery at a site we call Jabal Chauti of an elaborate proto-dynastic tableau that we call the Scorpion Tableau. While John Darnell deciphers the inscriptions at Yale, his wife Deborah Darnell spends much of the year in the field, mapping ancient highways and collecting new evidence. Darnell practices what she calls guerrilla archaeology, protecting the site from vandals and thieves, as well as from sand, wind and erosion, the natural enemies of their fragile discovery. Today, she's returning to the site to further document the scorpion tableau. Oh, no. Shoot, you have to shoot. Ada, Ada, Ahmed, Ahmed. Ahmed, you Someone has scratched a name over the face of the inscription. I know, and they're not even, not even thieves. They just wrote their name in the best place, which is the place where, where a scorpion wrote his name. Oh, God. So they didn't, they didn't know it was an ancient site. They didn't know. They just wrote their names like, like everyone else for the past 5,000 years. The Darnells take great precautions to safeguard the site and to preserve their find have fully photographed and sketched it. Closer inspection reveals the extent of the graffiti. Oh, alhamdulillah. Okay, this part, this part is, is the name. It's untouched. And let's see. Okay, the old inscriptions are carved deeply enough that we actually haven't lost that much, but oh, it was so beautiful. Okay, the key part here, which is nicely lit now, there's Falcon Horus over the scorpion. And again, um, there... Even in reflected sunlight, the 5,000-year-old etchings are difficult to see. But the trained eyes of the Darnells are able to recognize faint outlines in the lower portion of the scene. The figure appears to be a primitive scorpion, above which is a crude carving of a falcon. Does this inscription refer to King Scorpion? If so, nothing like this has ever been found before. The tableau details a specific historical event, and it's arranged in an interesting way. At the opening, we have a falcon with this rather triangular body over a scorpion. This is rather remarkable because it appears to be the first use of the name of the god Horus as a royal title. And this appears to tell us that the author of these events is a man named Scorpion, or Horus Scorpion more fully. The Horus name, like the Roman term Caesar, is another word for king. The title identifies Scorpion with Horus, the hawk or falcon, the patron god of Egyptian kingship. Later kings would have as many as five royal names symbolizing his many powers. But the Horus name will continue to be used by every Egyptian king for the next 3,000 years. Remarkably, King Scorpion is the first king in Egyptian history to use the Horus title. Working through the inscription, Darnell searches for more clues about King Scorpion. He is involved in a procession. We know this because there is a processional emblem here showing that this is a religious procession. There's a man in what appears to be a rather enveloping garment 
who is probably some sort of officiant with a long pole. This same religious figure, a kind of priest, can be found on many important artifacts from early Egyptian history, including the Narmer palette. Following the priest is another familiar scene. He is followed by two separate groups that are almost as remarkable as this early use of the Horus title, because what we see is a bound prisoner with rather wild hair trailing out behind him, his arms tied up behind him, pinioned like a bird, being held by a rope, held in the hands of this large figure here at the far left end of the tableau. This man, in his other hand, holds what appears to be a mace, a pear-headed mace that he brandishes roughly over the head of this bound captive. The captive appears to be labeled. Behind him is a bull's head that appears to be on a vertical pole as though this man's name or totemic emblem is bull's head on a stick. Darnell thinks that bull's head on a stick may be the name of the king of Nakata, a rival ancient city located on the Nile between Hierakonpolis and Abydos. And who is it that conquers the king of Nakata? The man who controls him and who thereby frames the scene is then none other than the ruler brandishing his mace with which he dispatches the enemies of order that man then being Horus Scorpion. Although primitive in nature the etching reveals a vital portrait of power the king wielding the all-important mace over a captive. Destined to become the prototype for later kings, this very scene will appear on artifacts and temple walls for the rest of Egyptian history. But the image on the scorpion tableau is the earliest smiting scene that can be tied to a specific historical event. The meaning is clear. The entire event receives a proto-hieroglyphic label, saddle bill stork with rearing serpent beneath its beak, a label meaning victory. The scorpion tableau, although primitive, may be the inspiration for Narmer's palette, carved 200 years later. Their central themes are identical. The conquering king bashes the head of his rival and celebrates with a victory procession. Most Egyptologists believe that the scene on Narmer's palette represents an actual historical event. Perhaps the same is true for the Scorpion Tableau? So we have here an actual historical event symbolizing the victory of Horus Scorpion over the forces of Nakata. And this victory itself and the subsequent procession leading back to Abydos, appears to have occurred right here at Jebel Chauti. If Darnell is right, the Scorpion Tableau may be the world's first known historical document of any significance. But how can we be sure these events actually took place? The geography of Jebel Chauti provides some clues and the place where King Scorpion may have been born provides others. Jebel Jauti, the place where King Scorpion carved his victory tableau, is located halfway between Abydos in the north and Hierakonpolis in the south. But Jebel Jauti is closest to a third major center in Upper Egypt, Nakada. Here at Nakata, the major desert trade routes converge. Whoever controls those trade routes commands the wealth of Upper Egypt. There is evidence that Hierakonpolis and Abydos may have been allies, or at least shared common customs and beliefs. 
They both share their patron god, Horus, the falcon. In fact, Hierakonpolis means city of the hawk in Greek. But Abydos and Hierakonpolis may also share King Scorpion. For although Scorpion is buried at Abydos, he may have come from Hierakonpolis. Now in its heyday at about 3500 BC, Hierakonpolis was the largest city in Egypt, the largest city along the Nile. It had everything that made up a city. It had houses, administrative zones, industrial zones, trash mounds, cemeteries, you name it, it had it. And this kind of complexity suggests to us that there must have been a very strong central government for the city. We certainly know that we had very rich elite populations here, and perhaps these were even the families of kings. In this favorable environment, the seeds of politics, art, commerce, and religion, in short, society, were sown and soon grew to full bloom. Here at Hierakonpolis, archaeologists have found Egypt's earliest mummies and the remnants of its first temple. Although the structure has been lost, later temples throughout Egypt will reflect the same basic architectural elements. This is the model of the temple at Hierakonpolis that dates to about 3500 BC. We've been able to reconstruct it based on both the architectural remains that we found, mainly post holes, but nevertheless we also have drawings from the same period that give us good evidence to suggest that we can reconstruct it in this way. This type of architecture continued to be used in Egypt um, throughout its long history and it became the model for sacred space in temples. It is here at this temple where archaeologists discovered the Narmer palette and the scorpion mace head. Is it possible that King Scorpion made offerings from here? This temple at Hierakonpolis is certainly a place where King Scorpion would have come to worship his patron god Horus to ensure a successful reign. Beyond the temple, there's further evidence from the city of the Falcon that suggests King Scorpion came from here. From the temple deposits, we have many images of falcons, but we also have scorpions. In fact, we're the only site where you get three-dimensional models of scorpions, as well as scorpions inscribed on bowls. The reason why is not entirely clear, but I believe it's because the female goddess of Hierakonpolis was in scorpion form. She would have been the wife of Horus of Hierakonpolis. King Scorpion taking the name of Scorpion would have been a very powerful image. And it certainly leads us to believe that King Scorpion would have come from Hierakonpolis, having chosen that as his name. But did King Scorpion actually live in Hierakonpolis? So far, no conclusive evidence has been found. What has been found are the remains of a palace of the living king. Until now, archaeologists relied on tombs, or palaces for the afterlife, to get a sense of where kings lived. But now, based on tombs, art, and the small bits of remains, archaeologists are able to construct a model of the only palace of the living from this time period in Egypt ever to be discovered. We found evidence of this wonderful niched brick architecture leading into this very elaborate gateway. And excavations made underneath here showed loading docks and storage facilities, all the places where the king would have stored his surplus and his taxes. And it is certainly from a palace like this, if not this very same palace, that King Scorpion would have ruled. Most likely, this living palace of King Scorpions in Hierakonpolis is the model on which he bases his afterlife palace in Abydos. With ties to both Hierakonpolis and Abydos, King Scorpion would have been the right man at the right time to lead a united force against the armies of Nakata. It will be a battle to control valuable trade routes and earthly riches, 
but it will also be a cosmic battle between gods. Hierakonpolis and Abydos both share the deity Horus, the falcon god who springs forth from Osiris. The patron god of Nakata is Set, the god of chaos, enemy of Osiris. Hierakonpolis and Abydos have powerful central leaders, evidenced by scenes of their kings presiding over orderly processions. But the people of Nakata, in ancient rock art, are depicted as wild, feather-wearing hunters and warriors. What's brewing is a classic confrontation between the forces of order versus the forces of chaos. One thing is certain, whoever wins the battle will control the wealth and power of Upper Egypt. It is 3250 BC, and it is King Scorpion who steps forward with a strategy to defeat Nakata. What is King Scorpion's strategy to defeat Nakata? Based on the geography at Jebel Jauti, this remote outpost in the desert, and the fact that the Scorpion Tableau is located here, John Darnell believes King Scorpion launches a sneak attack starting right here in Jebel Jauti. Scorpion, by choosing to attack Nakata through the desert, is almost certainly intending to rely on the element of surprise. Nakata has a large army on the Nile Valley, and they might have expected, if Abydos attacked, that Scorpion would come along the Nile from the north. But Scorpion does not approach Nakata along the Nile. Instead, he marches his troops out into the desert and hides behind Jebel Jauti. The Jebel, or mountain, is one of the only places that troops can ascend or descend from the high plateau of the desert. This rare desert pass is known as the Narrow Door. It is behind this door that King Scorpion waits with his army. Scorpion intends to launch his attack through the rear of Nakata coming through the desert. He also probably knows that Nakata is manning a major desert outpost due west of Nakata itself. Scorpion is able to attack through the desert and avoid completely any contact with the Nile Valley forces of Nakata. Scorpion also, by choosing the Jebel Chauti Road, is able to come down out of the desert south of the desert outpost of Nakata, and then driving rapidly north, a small force under Scorpion from Abydos would cut the Nakata forces on the Nile off from the desert outpost forces, and thereby achieve a quick and relatively bloodless victory over Nakata. King Scorpion's conquest of Nakata is a momentous occasion. It is the first time that all of Upper Egypt will be ruled by one king. In celebration, Scorpion parades the captured ruler of Nakata back to Abydos and marks the occasion by ordering the carving of the Scorpion Tableau. By carving the tableau, King Scorpion may also be inventing history. With the person of King Horus Scorpion, we really are then at the cusp between prehistory and history. On the Scorpion tableau itself and in numerous elements from the tomb of Horus Scorpion at Abydos, we have numerous elements showing the birth of the hieroglyphic script. So Scorpion emerges not only as the unifier of the South, but as one of the first figures in history, uh, in Egyptian history and history in general, about whom we can say we really know something about what he did, where he did it, and why, and perhaps even how he did it. 
The Scorpion Tableau is proving to be as important as the Narmer Palette in furthering our knowledge about the unification of Egypt. Egyptologists have long believed that Narmer achieved unification with one great battle. The new evidence from the Scorpion Tableau suggests that the process began much earlier. It used to be thought that unification was a single event. It was just one large war, and at the end of it, the victor was the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. Well, today it's clear that unification was a long and drawn out process that involved a lot of warfare, to be sure, but also diplomacy, trade, um, commerce, technological transfers, etc. The Scorpion Tableau establishes King Scorpion's victory over Nakata as the first known step toward the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. And in many ways, King Scorpion's consolidation of Upper Egypt may prove to be the key event to the ultimate creation of a unified pharaonic Egypt. Once the southern part of the country is unified, once Upper Egypt is a single kingdom, the ultimate domination of the north by the south can be said to be really a foregone conclusion. So what Scorpion depicts here in his early version of the Narmer tableau is the necessary precursor to what then becomes the ultimate, final, inevitable conclusion, Narmer's triumph over the last resistance in the north. So we have really the origins of pharaonic history, basic elements of pharaonic religion, paraphernalia, even the smiting scene itself, the king wielding his mace over the heads of his bound enemies. Um, pharaonic history in many ways can be said, symbolically at least, to begin with the Scorpion Tableau. King Scorpion will go on to rule a rich kingdom. He will develop trade routes as far away as Afghanistan, use writing to keep track of his riches, and art to celebrate his power and the power of his gods. He will build palaces and temples for the living and tombs for the afterlife. And as depicted on the scorpion macehead, he will bring water to the land and wealth to his people. It is King Scorpion who lays the foundation for one of the greatest civilizations the world has known. At the time of King Scorpion, all the building blocks for Egyptian civilization were already in place. You had writing, you had monumental architecture, you had a belief in the afterlife, you had an art system that will remain virtually unchanged for the next 3,000 years. And you also had an enduring belief in the central importance of the king, both for running the government and for running the Egyptian universe as they understood it. So all in all, you had everything you needed for making one of the world's most enduring civilizations. As Egyptologists carry on their quest to discover the origins of ancient Egypt, and as more evidence comes to light, scholars will continue to rewrite the history books. Perhaps, in the end, the person who will be recognized as one of the founding fathers of ancient Egypt will be King Scorpion. With all we've learned about King Scorpion so far, we're still barely scratching the surface. Archaeologists are digging year-round, piecing together the history of the entire pre-dynastic period. There are at least 10 more royal tombs to excavate in Abydos, with so much left to discover. Not just about Scorpion, but about all the rulers who came before and after him. We're not even sure that there was only one King Scorpion. There's some speculation that the artifacts we showed you may actually refer to two different kings. But at least this much is certain. There's only one Scorpion King in theaters, and that's me, and I better see you in the audience. For the History Channel, I'm The Rock. Thanks for watching.